Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are in session 5B, uh, just to, um, to welcome everyone. And we are at the 5B Scaling Innovative Education Projects in Digital Transformation and Grid Transition in Southeast Asia and Pacific. So it's a big group, and we would really like to welcome you uh, to this session. Now, so many countries are not only trying to catch up with, you know, um, with other countries, but also trying to keep pace with the fast changes in technology. And we have witnessed, you know, many countries uh, transform their education systems uh, with the advent of new technologies, uh, including AI. And we have been hearing this since this morning and the increased demand, of course, of industry, business and private sector for advanced skills, knowledge, and competencies. Now, um, at the same time, we also are aware of the challenges that you know schools, universities, and technical vocational institutions are faced with, including equity, access, quality, and more prominently these days, relevance. And so, um, as a result, many of our countries have adopted you know reform initiatives embark on these reforms uh, to sustain you know uh, good outcomes and so um, there are many in innovations that were introduced and um, we are very fortunate uh, because this afternoon we will be hearing a great sample of innovations from our distinguished panel of speakers and discussants and um, these innovations, of course, were no, by no means easy. Uh, there were many challenges that they were faced with, but at the end of the day, um, it has been proven to be feasible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, we have two speakers this afternoon. First is Dr. Kitty Pong from Wong, President of the Office of National Higher Education Science Research and Innovation Policy Council. Dr. Kitty Pong is responsible for the formulation of national policy and initiatives on higher education, science, technology, and innovation in Thailand. Now, Dr. Kitty Pong's current policy initiatives include higher e education, innovation sandbox, restructuring research and funding system, and national strategy to promote innovation-driven enterprise in Thailand. And um, welcome, Dr. 
Dr. Kitty Pong. Uh, joining us online is Mr. Felipe Hitoko. May we know if you're already here, Mr. Hitoko? Thank you. Uh, okay, here. so he, yes, hello, Mr. Felipe. Uh, he's the head of the Pacific Regional Education Framework or PACREF Facilitation Unit hosted by the University of South Pacific. Before moving to the USP, Mr. Hitoko was policy advisor at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, where he coordinated the development of the PACREF policy document in collaboration with the 15 participating countries, together with regional and international agencies supported by development partners. Welcome, Mr. Felipe. We also have distinguished panel of discussions. Uh, Mr. Wayne Mendiola is the acting secretary of the National Department of Education, Federated States of Micronesia. Mr. Menjola served the education system in the country since 2003 in various roles, uh, such as Assistant Secretary for the Division of Formal and for Non-Formal Education and Assistant Secretary for the Department of Quality and Effectiveness. Mr. Mendiola has been instrumental in driving reforms for improved quality in basic education. And we understand that he's involved in the improving quality of basic education in North Pacific, which is a long-standing project and includes two countries, Federated States of Micronesia and Republic of Marshall Islands. And I would like to acknowledge the presence of our colleagues from RMI in the audience. Mr. Jan Kaltau is the Director of Tertiary Education, Ministry of Education and Training, Vanuatu. Mr. Kaltau is providing leadership and management in setting strategic direction and planning the implementation of activities within the Tertiary Education Directorate, which includes scholarship, skills development, higher education, and teacher development. Ms. Leifa Lin is our Deputy Director General, Directorate General of Technical Vocational Education and Training from the Cambodia Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training. Uh, Ms. Fallin oversees the Tibet Development Policy and Strategy and provides guidance to operationalize the Tibet policies. Ms. Lee has been the key government counterpart of the ADB's Skills for Competitive Pro Project since 2019. And then we have Assistant Secretary Alma Ruby Torio. She's the Assistant Secretary for Curriculum and Teaching Curriculum Development learning delivery and learning resources of the Philippines Department of Education and her work centers on the development and implementation of national education policies under the curriculum and teaching strand and she supervises programs, projects, and activities relative to the development of the curriculum, learning delivery, and the provision of quality learning resources. Now, last but certainly not the least, Professor Dr. Ir Taufan Marhandrayana, Head of the Science and Tec Technopark Institute of Technology Bandung in Indonesia. Professor Ir Taufan holds progressive, various progressive leadership positions in ITB over the years. He obtained his PhD degree from Texas A&M University, majoring in oil and gas field of discipline, and has in recent years pivoted to renewable energies aligned with decarbonization initiatives and research carried out by university. He has more than eight intellectual property rights filed and has more than 38 publications in research. So we do have a distinguished uh, panel of um, discussions and speakers this afternoon. So I would just like to already start uh, Dr. Kitty Pong. Uh, if you can kindly share with us the higher education transformations in Thailand and what were the main barriers also, as well as key enablers, which will provide important lessons for us uh, in our countries uh, to transition to a green economy and to use digital transformation uh, for, you know, for growth and development. Thank you, Dr. Kitibong. Over, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Lynette, and uh, 
Good uh, afternoon, uh, friends and colleagues and uh, participants. Uh, I, I was asked to chair uh, two projects, uh, 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 education innovation uh, in Thailand. So um, uh, I, I have uh, the PowerPoint, uh, can I show it? Uh, Kylie, uh, put the PowerPoint on. Um, uh, what I would like to share is, uh, uh, one is uh, we call uh, Higher Education Innovation Sandbox in Thailand. And uh, the other uh, I would like to share on the uh, the, the platform of uh, high uh, uh, upskilling, reskilling and upskilling platform uh, in Thailand. Uh, the first one, the first uh, is uh, degree based. It's, uh, it, it is done in uh, university. But the second, we build the platform uh, by our uh, organization. Um, this because uh, we, we, we thought about the uh, transformation of education uh, because uh, we are in the changing world and especially, you know, uh, we change our society or our living style changing from what we call three-stage life uh, to multi-stage life. Uh, multi-stage life means uh, uh, before when we were born, uh, once you, uh, we were born, then we have education and then work and then retire. This is a three-stage life. But for multi-stage life, uh, you were born, educate and work and stop and change the career and then back to studies and then uh, got a new career or the same career and work until uh, 60 normally you retired but uh, now 60 still young so people here you are still very very young and uh, you know 60 is actually in the multi-stage life, it started to work again. Uh, they estimated that, this is from research, they estimated that uh, people will live in 30 years time, mo many people will live 100 years, right? Then if you get retired 60 years old, what you do? So they, uh, set a new uh, age for retirement uh, to be 79. Yeah, so you still have to work. This is, this is the things that we think will change our lifestyle and then change the training system. So that's why we start to do the innovation sandbox on education. Uh, the second project that we do is uh, because there are a lot of uh, investment coming uh, in, into our countries, both from domestic investment and also foreign direct investment. And uh, one of the uh, disadvantages is the lack of uh, skill. That this is uh, the, 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 the important uh, factors. Uh, that's why sometimes uh, investment uh, does not flow as it should be. So then how we catch up with the investment growth. So we need uh, to do something that we can provide human resources and skill to catch up with the technology as quick as possible. That's the second project why we build the platform. And also in the second project, not just only uh, catching up with the investment, why don't you put the, the time uh, count? Because I still <laughs> then I wish <laughs> people please put the time count for ten minutes from now on. <laughs> uh, the second project uh, we also recognize that uh, there are some people in Thailand, many actually, uh, many students they dropped out from the education system, and uh, many students uh, are also seeking. Uh, to have employment, and then uh, uh, we're trying to think how how can we help them to get back 
to the you know at least uh, upskilling. So then we bring them back uh, and use uh, an approach which is not innovate by us, but uh, we I can say we not copy, but uh, we transfer this kind of know-how from uh, the uh, they call a foundation um, a, a foundation called generation which is a sub, uh, non-profit subsidiaries of McKinsey. Um, okay, uh, let's go back from the beginning. This, that is uh, the introduction and summary. Now I've got uh, into the detail. Um, uh, please, uh, next please. Uh, this is what I uh, presented to you at, from three-stage life to multi-stage life, and you will be retired at the age of 79. <laughs> Next, please. And uh, this is, uh, uh, we look at the investment growth in Thailand. And you see, um, th we did the survey, we call it a talent landscape, uh, uh, the demand of human resources in uh, 12 target industry in Thailand. Uh, we've got both uh, the numbers of uh, uh, demand. And also, uh, we look at the, we, we look at the, the uh, we call it a critical position, which industry will uh, need people to do. And then from that position, job position, uh, we identify the functional competencies. And from these functional competency of each uh, job position, uh, we use it to design the training package uh, into the, plat uh, the platform that I mentioned. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, about four years ago, we also introduced um, uh, introduced the idea of innovation sandbox on higher education into the uh, Higher Education Act. Uh, I I, uh, I I was one of the uh, of those that uh, 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 developing this act and. If you look at the wording that we used for the benefit of creating innovations in higher education, because we, we know if higher education not change, and many people think that it's very really difficult to change higher education, and then we put it in, into the act that higher education has to do innovation. So then uh, we give the power to the minister of the higher education ministry, uh, that he can allow or permit uh, education institution to create or provide new way of learning, which different from the old fashion and all the restrictions in the old fashion of education can be waived uh, away so that they can do the 100% new design of education approach. And uh, I am the secretariat for when people, you know, asking for setting up the sandbox, then we will look at it, right? Next, please. Uh, next, please. I would like to uh, show an example. This is one example of uh, what we call high, higher education sandbox. Uh, this is uh, in the computer engineering and digital technology. Uh, in Jula Longon University, the top university in Thailand, uh, normally a uh, faculty of engineering, they, in the normal track, they uh, have uh, about 800 students enrolled. Uh, when we introduce this sandbox, and then there are about 300 students, you know, enrolled in, in, in this track, the sandbox track. And what we provide the education is uh, the link between the university, the faculty, and industrial consortiums. Right now, uh, we have about 50 uh, companies joining uh, these uh, 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 sandbox. And what is special is this. We do not wait for student study three or four years and then work. Because when students study three or four years, they have to invest their time. And people like me, their parents, <laughs> have to invest the money. And I, I know we invest a lot, a lot of money for one student. 
and I, I keep asking the university, uh, if they, they don't get the enough return to scale, good return to scale, who responsible for that? No one responsible. It's come back to parents. So <laughs> we design this, that we do not wait for students to study four years and then work. They will use certificate rather than degree to apply for the job. And the certificate will be certified by the university with the, this industry consortium accepted and value the certificate as what they, they hire in the, in the industry. So this is, uh, and, and uh, I think this is a very new one that uh, we do it. Uh, this is for computer engineering and digital technology. Uh, uh, please go back. Uh, we, we design uh, the study as modules, uh, five modules together. And students will use these five certificates to earn the money. In the first year, we're trying to uh, provide learning for the student and not, uh, you know, uh, many, uh, not, not the old way. Here is we select what they should know as uh, that they can do what we call a full stack developer. If they can do full stack developer, and then we certify them and the companies can hire them once they got this certificate. And the student can work in the company as long as they like. And once they feel that uh, this is not enough, they would like to up their job position and up the salary. They will come back to the same course, the next module, next two modules, and then they will get a certificate as data engineering, like this. So he can come back and forth, work and uh, back to study when they require to up their skill. And then um, uh, uh, if they do not work, they can finish this within uh, three and a half years. But uh, we expect that student uh, will, will, will uh, you know, earn money uh, during their, uh, you know, studies. And then they can take uh, seven years, eight years. That's okay. We open. So this is a, uh, uh, one of uh, the, the, the sandbox. Another sandbox, uh, almost the same thing, but uh, this one is uh, a, a, uh, in the, the area of high-tech entrepreneurs. And we do not use a university lecturer to do uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the teachers, right? But using uh, real entrepreneurs and all over the world coming to this course. So this course is very premium, very, very expensive. Even, even, even I cannot afford. But they invented the, the way how to, how to uh, organize this kind of course. Uh, almost every student uh, have uh, someone sponsor behind them, uh, mostly uh, companies. And those companies probably they have some tied with those uh, students. So that's why uh, the student can, uh, you know, afford uh, this uh, premium course. Uh, the, the, the similar uh, arrangement. Okay, next please. Um, but uh, some barriers. Uh, the mo uh, I think the uh, most important bar barriers is a weak link between university and industry. So that's why uh, these kind of courses can be done very well in university that has strong link with uh, industry. That is the first one. Uh, the other one is uh, some kind of unfavorable uh, university internal process. A lot, a lot of uh, uh, red tape and you know procedures in university, unbelievable. So we sometimes get to university to talk with the council, university council or university management in order that the uh, those that organize this kind of courses, they can overcome this. Uh, with the help from from us, that's that's another thing. And uh, the other thing is uh, hesitation to change. Uh, in university, people get used to the old way of doing things, and very difficult to change, uh, especially professors. <laughs> you know, 
difficult, but uh, uh, there are in university usually there are about ten percent of people that are change agent. So we are trying to find those change agent. Um, we also have uh, some of the enablers. Uh, for example, uh, before before we implement this, we had some of the projects with university already. For example, a talent mobility, sending uh, faculties to work in the private sector. So that's, they get used to the uh, companies and also they have the network with the company. Uh, we have the, some of the cluster development, uh, encouraging university companies to work together, doing the research together and so on. We change our funding system in Thailand so that uh, we sometimes provide funding to uh, companies and companies use those kind of funding uh, to uh, work with a university and so on. Uh, also, uh, one uh, uh, last but not least is the uh, role of intermediary. Uh, in this case, we set up what we call STEM Plus as the uh, uh, one-stop services uh, unit facilitate. Okay, next please. Uh, these are the things that we have done. Uh, future food cluster, encouraging uh, university working with the companies, and then we have a funding system for them. Um, uh, next please. Uh, this is another project is, uh, we, we call it a high skill workforce development platform. Uh, we've got the incentive from the uh, government that those that uh, bring people to train under this uh, training uh, platform, they will get a 200% tax deduction. Uh, and also if they hire or employ a STEM workforce, they get 100% tax exemption. And uh, I also work uh, working with the uh, board of investment for SME, which they, they do not have a benefit from the tax. And then we will do a cash refund. Uh, we call cash back uh, for those that invest in training the people. So not uh, enough time, so I go quickly, then we can discuss later on. Uh, this is a generation model, which I borrowed from the McKinsey uh, Generation Foundation. This is training those that uh, drop out from education system, and about eight, uh, about eighty percent of uh, those got training from this uh, uh, get employed. So this is a uh, because uh, when we do training, we have to talk with the employer first, and then uh, we once we know the requirement of employer, we design the course and recruit the student in the recruitment uh, system. The employer also participate actively to recruit uh, the student and then uh, work with university to do the training uh, package. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Kitty Pong. That was really very insightful. And I think what we need to really emphasize is the linkage with industry, private sector, the businesses, because that's really key you know, to facilitating uh, school to work transition. And of course, uh, we would like now to call on Mr. Felipe Hitoko. Um, he will be talking about the Pacific Regional Education Framework. This is really a very unique approach to regionalism in education in the Pacific. Um, Mr. Felipe, can you please tell us, you know, share with us the priorities of the countries which are based on emerging new issues across the countries in the Pacific, including on climate change and resilience, and how effective um, can you see is the PACREF program functioning, and what are the early lessons that you can share with us this afternoon? Over to you, Mr. Felipe. Thank you very much, and uh, bring your greetings from uh, Suba in Fiji, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present on the uh, Pacific Regional Education Framework, uh, how it is uh, organized and also some of the uh, uh, programs that we are undertaking through this uh, regional framework. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we would like to share that uh, uh, under the uh, Pacific uh, principle of regionalism, 
uh, is uh, developed by our civic uh, leaders. Uh, we have used this principle to uh, work together in the region, together with our development partners, uh, and also with our uh, regional and international agencies uh, to uh, resolve some of the common challenges that we face in the Pacific. So um, very uh, briefly, how have we uh, uh, developed or come up with the, uh, with the framework? Um, for a long time, we were, our leaders in the Pacific have recognized that we have uh, we are faced with common challenges uh, across the uh, Pacific region. We have 15 uh, small island countries that are participating in this uh, uh, initiative uh, and with quite diverse uh, challenges and uh, context. So uh, we work together with our development partners. We recognize that uh, we have limited resources. We are quite uh, limited in our national budgets and also in terms of our human capacity. Uh, in most of our uh, ministries of education are very uh, small and uh, limited in terms of the human resource. Uh, and also we therefore very much reliant on our uh, government partners to uh, provide that extra resource that is needed to transform and uh, progress uh, our education systems uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, uh, also in terms of uh, human resource, we have a huge challenge of uh, uh, attrition, and that is uh, our teachers, for example, uh, leaving our shores uh, and moving across to uh, uh, neighboring uh, countries, particularly Australia and New Zealand, uh, where our teachers and therefore we continue to face uh, this challenge of teacher development and training to meet our own national uh, teacher needs. And also we have quite a big challenge in geographical isolation. Uh, most of our uh, uh, islands are scattered across vast areas of ocean. Uh, in uh, terms of Kiribati, for example, you have to uh, do international travel in order to visit some of the small islands. Uh, and therefore, uh, it uh, poses uh, an issue of excess inequity uh, in terms of service delivery. Uh, and there's quite a, a huge gap between the rural and the urban areas. So there's a, a rural and urban divide. Uh, which is, uh, Excuse me, Mr. Felipe, can we just request you to um, move up the slides because we can, it's still, and okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we have the issue of uh, geographical isolation and one of the emerging issues is uh, youth issues uh, where we have uh, uh, a large number of uh, students are taking out, they saluted to by the previous speaker. So we also have the issue in, in the region, in some of our uh, countries, and a large number of our youths who are out of school, out of school age, uh, particularly at the secondary uh, school age level. And of course, a big uh, challenge that is facing our region is the impact of climate change uh, and also natural disasters. We've seen in our region uh, some of the uh, strongest cyclones that have hit uh, our region in the past years. And of course, uh, the uh, volcano that hit uh, Tonga uh, over the past year. And that has uh, really impacted on our the overall development uh, in our small island states. So in terms of uh, working together, we have come, come up with uh, uh, an idea that 
uh, we can work together as uh, collective uh, uh, efforts and also with the support from our development partners uh, that we can uh, resolve uh, and uh, mitigate some of the impacts of the challenges uh, that we have. So uh, we have come up with uh, with uh, two regional frameworks that we started way back in 2001, when our education ministers met for the first time and recognized that they need to work together and develop a framework where they can uh, commit uh, their energies and efforts uh, towards uh, achieving their, their common challenges. So they've already had to the third one that we are working on now is the civil regional education framework or PECREP in short. Uh, and that was adopted by our ministers of education in 2018 uh, when they met in Nauru. So through the lessons learned in the previous uh, two frameworks, they've uh, come up with uh, uh, three, uh, amongst others, uh, basic principles uh, or drivers of change that they uh, that they have agreed to, and one uh, one is the uh, need for clear uh, policy objectives if they are to achieve uh, higher quality in uh, schooling and also clear uh, relevance in the curriculum and also in the programs that they offer and better educational pathways for students. So it meets the aspirations of all students, all capabilities within the system, uh, and also achieving uh, uh, teacher professionalism and improving on the quality uh, and the effectiveness of teachers then we can, uh, we can better the uh, student learning outcomes and the well-being of our students. Uh, so that is basically the, uh, the concept uh, of the, uh, the PECREP or the Civil Regional Education Framework. Uh, so um, uh, all our 15 participating countries have committed uh, towards this framework together with our uh, uh, development partners. Uh, as I've said, uh, regionalism uh, is the basic principle under which the uh, PECREP has been developed. We have developed a, an architecture uh, that uh, drives its implementation and the, uh, the main products of its implementation are what we call in the regional public goods uh, that are being developed through the various activities uh, under, the, uh, under the framework. So in terms of the uh, architecture in the Pacific uh, education, uh, we have the ministers who are the oversight uh, of the program. They meet every, uh, every two years. Uh, the last meeting they had was in March this year, where they met in uh, Auckland in New Zealand and uh, they provided new directions uh, towards the, uh, the, the framework. Uh, and the Pacific Heads of Education Systems, they met every year and they review the implementation and they have a, a, a steering committee of the Pacific Heads uh, comprising of uh, five uh, heads of education. And I'm happy that uh, Wayne is uh, uh, here in the group as one of the discussant, uh, who is uh, the new chair uh, of the Pacific Heads of Education Systems uh, and also the steering committee from the uh, FSM. Uh, so countries are sharing information uh, in terms of learning, so they come together every now and then. The next meeting will be held in Monday next week. Uh, week after next. Uh, so all our country focal points from the 15 uh, countries uh, uh, will be in Nandi um, week after next to come and share uh, learning and experiences in terms of uh, how they're interacting with, with, uh, with the framework. Uh, 
So new issues are emerging uh, that has come up from our ministers in the meeting in uh, this year. So uh, we are being guided by uh, what they are telling us. Um, so we are happy that uh, the midterm review of the program that was undertaken towards the end of last year uh, have confirmed uh, this was an independent review by uh, international consultants uh, and recruited by the uh, Asian Development Bank, who are the uh, grant agent for our funding. Uh, and they have confirmed that uh, the program is working well. Uh, so that, uh, that confirms to us the, uh, uh, the progress and the direction that we're taking. Um, now, if I uh, am just to, uh, to complete in the next slide, um, uh, we have an example of, uh, of regional good uh, that we, uh, we are working on, uh, which is the Wakamwan uh, uh, We are calling the Wakamwan Lernikar. Uh, I hope it is showing in the next screen. Anyway, the, the working one I'm learning up is uh, uh, using uh, information technology uh, to uh, um, to develop uh, resources for literacy and numeracy. Uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, this is an innovative uh, uh, project. Uh, it's a regional good under the framework where we are putting online uh, resources that can be accessed by all uh, 15 of our member countries. Uh, so uh, uh, it was to be an online uh, 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 resource uh, for our leaks and numeracy materials and also research materials that are undertaken in the region uh, and also countries that wish to share uh, their own resources, they can make them accessible to this, uh, to this hub, which is hosted by the University of the South Pacific uh, and uh, it is being uh, managed by the Institute of Education. Uh, which is uh, based in Tonga, uh, in the kingdom of Tonga. So uh, this hub was launched uh, earlier this year, it, and we are happy that it is now online and uh, can be accessed by our uh, uh, member countries. The, the main objective was to share uh, literacy and numeracy resources uh, across the uh, Results of our literacy and numeracy assessment in the region through the Pacific Literacy and uh, Numeracy Assessment Pilna uh, is showing that uh, we need to improve on our literacy and numeracy uh, levels for our uh, member countries. So, this pro project is being developed under the FACPRA uh, program, and we are happy that. Uh, it is now uh, live online, but because of our uh, limited internet access in the Pacific Island countries, uh, we've added two additional strengths to the online portal for this uh, project. Uh, and that is one uh, strand which is offline, and that's material, print material. Uh, and the other one is still using the radio uh, to provide information. Uh, as we've uh, seen in the volcano in Tonga, uh, when everything uh, falls down the internet, the technology falls down, uh, the old radio uh, was the only means of communication uh, in Tonga. So we revived uh, the radio as uh, part of this uh, app because it's still the, the main channel of communication. Uh, when things uh, are getting uh, offline. Uh, so, apart from this uh, Wakamoana Learning Hub, we have other projects that are being developed online, and uh, hopefully 
uh, it is going to uh, to regulate the infrastructure for our internet. In our small islands become better, we would be able to venture into more advanced technology uh, in terms of uh, dissolving or, or making uh, education more accessible to our remote uh, island areas. And of course, our region is uh, very much impacted uh, by climate change. And uh, one of our regional goods, which is linked to the part of one that we have, uh, is on the development of uh, life skills. Uh, making use of our cultural uh, practices, our traditional knowledge uh, to try and make us become more resilient uh, in terms of the impact of uh, climate change that is coming into, into our region. Uh, so that uh, very briefly is a summary of the civil regional education framework and the developments uh, that's ongoing. We have 16 uh, regional goods in total. That is the focus uh, of the program. And we are happy that progress is uh, going on well with all the uh, development of the 16 regional goods. Uh, phase one comes to an end in the end of 2024, which is next year. And we look forward uh, to more of the regional goods being completed and used by our member countries to improve uh, the education uh, programs and services in their own countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Felipe. This is really a great example of how, you know, cohesive you can be with, with given a framework that is underpinning you know, the, the implementation of all of these activities in the 15 countries in the Pacific. And so there are many lessons also that we can learn from this experience. Now, if I may, if I, I would just like to call on Mr. Mendiola uh, to tell us more about your initiatives to connect schools on all islands of SF, SF, FSM to drive access and quality improvements. This is a tall order, but you have done it. And so please share with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna be the one standing between you and the reception. So I'll, I'll try to make it short. Uh, but in, in regards to the question on how we are connecting our schools, just to give you a little, a little um, geography. Um, FSM is mainly made of four main islands, but we have 608 islands altogether. Some of them are not habited yet, uh, and they're not up for sale anyways. Um, and we have, we have about 64 schools that are in the remote islands that can only be reached by ship. And sometimes, not sometimes, but most of the time, ships go to those schools two times in one academic year. So you can see that um, it takes so much time to be there. So when the pandemic came around, we hit a wall right there. How do we make sure that continuity of learning can be continued on in those very, very remote schools? that it will take three to four days by ship to get there in twice in an, in an academic year. So what we, the initiative that we're doing right now is trying to set up satellites in all the remote islands where the schools are so that there is connectivity in all the schools. And, and part of that, we created take-home learning packages and that can be transferred via internet. So in case, not just pandemic, but as uh, Felipe mentioned, we are prone to natural disasters. Um, most of our remote islands are very flat and king tides and with the uh, high sea level rise, it's taking over a lot of our, our schools. And so we made that connectivity to ensure that continuity of learning can continue on. Uh, and it's as, as we, as I speak right now, I just received report from one of the 
major states that they have installed all the satellites in all the remote islands of Yap. Uh, we're very small in terms of island, but the ocean itself to go from east to west uh, in FSM, it's almost traveling the entire continental US. That's how widespread the islands are in the in the Pacific, Northern Pacific Ocean. So that's that's where we are in terms of technology. And and I know being a young nation with a young education system, yet trying to catch up with all these changes that the world has to offer, we also need to look at how can we prepare our students, not just academically, but we need to look at the vocational side of things. Because in the islands, that's how we do things. That's how we learn things, by our hands. And so it's, it's good, it's very important that we continue to cultivate that interest in our students. And so we're moving, we're launching a new project. It's called um, Skills Enhancement and Employability Project. And that is to help our vocational programs. Uh, we have some vocational programs in our high schools, but very fragmented. So we want to make it structured. And that's part of the project. And we're also trying to establish a training center for specialized uh, technical careers that students want to uh, pursue and provide scholarship to promising students to attend or, or go to these uh, institutions. And we're doing all of these along with you know, our Chamber of Commerce, which is also difficult in our islands because the industry is not as big. But the reason behind why we wanted to do this, in the, especially in terms of vocational, we, we found through our data that a lot of our high school students drop out uh, once they reach 10th grade, because our compulsory education is from first grade to eighth grade only. High school is not compulsory. So by 10th grade, we have a big dropout of students. And we found out the reason, most of the reason behind of that is because they're not interested in academic and we're not cultivating their vocational and technical skills. So we, we bring forth this initiative to address those students. How can we maintain them so that they don't drop out and that we continue to cultivate them? At the same time, we did a research of our own citizens, of some citizens who are living in the US compared to other Pacific Island countries. And we found that there, we have quite similar number of people living in mainland US. But when it comes to remittance, our citizens provide very low amount. And the reason behind is those of citizens that are working in the US, they don't have the skills. They were just grabbed out of the street and sent to the US. So they're at the bottom scale in terms of employment. So we're, we cannot stop the fact that our people, the young ones, are really migrating to the US because of the special relations that we have with the United States. Uh, our citizens can live, they can work, they can attend school visa free in the US. So most of our young are just flying out there. Uh, just to give you a snapshot, during the pandemic, we have about 2,000 people left the islands just to go to the U.S. And so since we cannot stop that trend, what we can do is give them the skills so they can get high-paying jobs, so that they can remit higher uh, money to help support the economy. Uh, since we, the industry that we have is not enough to... Um, to all these people, but at least we train them to go out there to remit more uh, in that in that matter. So basically, those are those were the reasons behind, and and also the fact that we also need to cultivate our own local workforce because not all of them will leave. Some will have to remain and take care of um, the economy and the people and this, the country. So we need to develop our own local workforce that can handle the work within the, the country 
We need to train them, give them the skills to go out those to, for those who are going out. And we need to make sure that our students remain in school. And we need to cultivate that interest. Because as I said in the beginning, this is how we learn in the islands, by using our hands. And I think that's where most of the people wish they want to go. And, and we need to cultivate that in India. And that's the reason why we're, we're we are launching this project November 2nd, next week if I'm not mistaken, or the week after, the project will be launched. And it's a big project that would entire, the entire FSM will have to go through. And we're hoping that it can really change the mindset of the people, uh, especially of our leaders. I know we all understand, we, us in the FSM, most people just think that the only way to succeed is academically. We need to change that mindset right now, that it's not just academic. It's also vocational and technical careers uh, that will really change things. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we can equate those two, that if you graduate from a vocational uh, institution with a two-year tournament, what does it equal to in the academic side? So we're, we also establish qualification framework to match those two so that one do not supersedes the other, but equate them. So. That's, that's those, those are the initiatives that we're doing in regards to making sure that we can reach out to all the remote schools, our students, and also to make sure that we can cultivate the needs of our, of our people in terms of vocational and, and technical careers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mendiola. I mean, th those are really the basic, basic challenges. And so we can also see the need to really enhance um, skills development. In, in your country. Now, if I may, it's a good segue to Mr. John Kaltau because he's also going to talk about the skills development project that they are designing currently. And there are really many things that they are considering, including institu institutional strengthening, um, creating skills pathways, and producing skills, um, demand-driven skills qualifications. And so these are really critical components also of this project, and please share with us, uh, Mr. Kalta. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, in uh, Vanuatu, um, we have 50% uh, uh, of the population are uh, youth, age uh, 15 to 29. Uh, most of them are not in education, or training, or employment. So um, we have uh, 47 institutions, vocational institutions that are not uh, really functioning well. So uh, ADB Pacific uh, came uh, to us and we requested uh, we work together in uh, uh, helping one of the institution, uh, Vanuatu Institute of Technology, uh, in seeing how we could help our uh, students and uh, the uh, youths and uh, girls, women that need uh, uh, training. So um, we have, uh, we came up with uh, three outputs. So the first output is uh, institutional capacity to deliver quality in demand and gender responsive training strengthen. The output two is uh, gender responsive, inclusive, and climate resilient infrastructure and equipment at Port Vila and Malamba campus extended. And output three, inclusive and targeted training programs, particularly for women and people with disabilities implemented. These are the three out output that uh, we feel that it will uh, really help the 50% youth of our population. So uh, I think um, the relevance and the responsiveness that we have between our industry, uh, it will really progress our uh, development with our youths. So I think uh, coming to this conference, and networking, uh, we will be able to work together because some of these uh, 
uh, skills support skills delivery uh, projects have happened in other countries which uh, we can learn from and be able to uh, develop our uh, nation so that we can have uh, we can have outcomes decide outcomes that we our country aspires to achieve thank you I think, yeah, you raise a very important point and that is really the networking, you know, interacting with different partners. And this is this forum is a good opportunity to start, you know, the conversation with all our partners here. And of course, learning and knowledge exchange would be critical. Uh, skills development is really very broad, but, you know, there have been many practices already that are in place which you can also adapt and contextualize in your country settings. Now, this again, a good segue because we're also going to call on Ms. Falin uh, to talk about the, the, the efforts that they're undertaking on technical vocational education and training. And I understand that as part of economic diversification and industrial transformation, you have already embarked on, you know, uh, implementing the industrial transformation roadmap. Um, I think it's for textile and, and apparel, but, you know, there are many other industries that you have also uh, developed for these maps. And I think it is very important for, for our colleagues here present to, to hear about your skills development roadmap and how you are implementing it and what are the challenges moving forward that needs to be addressed and lessons learned. Thank you. Over to you, Ms. Palin. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much, uh, ADB, for giving me the opportunity uh, to be here. In order to save time, let me go briefly to the question um, being asked. Um, in Cambodia, uh, our new government, as you know, we just uh, uh, do the election. So we have the new government, um, you know, focusing on the new strategy, find new prioritized strategy. Um, the first one is the human capital that our government is focusing on and similar to the other Pacific region and uh, also to Thailand. Um, uh, we have a special similarity about the challenges um, such as the linkage between the uh, industry and the schools. I think this is uh, the most common in all over the countries in the world, not only in Asia, but um, even in some developed countries. Um, so under the ADB support um, we have uh, conducted so far uh, from the short course training um, to a big long term uh, training such as the diploma program and the, the skill for competitiveness project and also a skill for future economy, which uh, currently uh, we, our ministry, uh, Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training. Um, so we are working on those projects uh, under the support of ADB, AFD, and uh, joined with the Royal Government of Cambodia. Um, with this, we produce, um, under ADB support, we produce uh, uh, industry transformation map um, for the textile and apparel and industry, um, which is last for five years. Uh, and then we also have another one, um, which is called Cambodia Skill Development Roadmap. Yes, uh, from 2023 to 2035, so 12 years if you count. So um, for this, because Cambodia has a lot of uh, youth, you know, uh, age from 15 to 64, which is um, the most uh, used uh, labor force, uh, yes, to produce uh, labor intensive. So we wish um, our policy is to develop those youth to have uh, equip them with the high skill uh, to increase the productivity, um, to equip them with the technology adoption uh, for this 21st uh, century and uh, to fit with the industrial uh, revolution, the 4IO, which uh, the previous presenter also mentioned about this one. Yeah. So um, we have a lot uh, to share and uh, working a lot with the ADB and ADB also support us a lot about. So I would like to like briefly uh, 
uh, tell you, clarify about the industry transformation map. So the purpose is uh, to transform from the low level cost to uh, high level cost. Yeah, so uh, we need, in order to do that, we need uh, to be ready with the technology adoption to equip with those uh, young people. This is very significant that uh, a lot of country, including Cambodia, we do need to equip to make whatever uh, to support those uh, yeah, young people. And uh, for another one, uh, which I just mentioned, it's about the Cambodia uh, Skill Development Roadmap, um, which is uh, focused on five uh, pillars. The first one is uh, strengthening the quality uh, of TVET. And this is also aligned with our national uh, TVET policy and also other policy. Uh, coming next, we're going to have the uh, electronic automotive industry, which is coming next as well. So, um, so um, the second one is uh, we're going to enhance the uh, branding of TVET because uh, a lot of people may have set the limit, the mindset that TVET is not uh, really good for them to go to. So we are trying our best in order to raise our awareness about the TVET and uh, to increase our enrollment in TVET as well. Uh, the third one um, is the industry relevant TVET. Um, this one is also linked to the industry textile, uh, textile apparel. And um, the fourth one is the government and leadership. So in order to make TVET improvement, we have to equip uh, not only the teachers or the students, but also the uh, management, the management of the TT. Yeah, the technical training institutes, um, they have to uh, be able to adapt uh, to new technology, uh, to lead properly, uh, uh, to change the TVET image. And also um, the last one is the funding and sustainability. With this, I would like to raise about the skill development, road, um, the uh, SDF, Skill Development Fund. Also, this is under the ADB support, uh, under the Skill for Competitiveness project. Um, we have the SDF as the independent agency um, to link, to solve the problem between the linkage uh, between the industry and the TTI, the TVET school. So um, if uh, they provide the incentive to the industry um, who have the joint training with the TVET schools, in Cambodia. So this is one of the things that we could solve those problems um, between uh, to solve the linkage between the industry. Yes. Um, the third, this is two um, trans two uh, skill roadmap that I have just mentioned. And I would like to also um, mention about if the time allow, but I, I think uh, if if time allow, I would like to mention more. There are many things more that we would like to do, but uh, just would like to finish here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fadim. You have done a lot in, in Cambodia in terms of technical, vocational education and training, ensuring the responsiveness uh, to the needs of industry and private sector. But we still have three, two and a half days to go. So, I mean, we can always, you know, have this interaction with you moving forward. But thank you so much, Ms. Palin. And now I would like to call on Asek Alma of the Philippines Department of Education and Training. Um, DepEd has really implemented the learning continuity plan during the, the pandemic. And you have already embarked on the development of an education technology master plan. And I understand that you're also preparing the draft framework on ICT-enabled uh, teaching and learning. And so we'd like to hear more from you. Asek Alma, thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Lynette, and thank you, ADB, for inviting me to be part of this dialogue. As mentioned, I am with the Department of Education, or in short, we call it DEPED. DEPED is one of the three agencies in charge of the educational system of the country. The other agencies include the Commission on Higher Education and the uh, Technical Education Skills and Development Authority. DepEd uh, covers uh, kindergarten, or we call it the K to 12. Uh, the K stands for uh, kindergarten. Uh, the 12 years of education covers uh, 
uh, the grades one to six, uh, and uh, the middle school, we call it uh, junior high school, seven to 10, and uh, the uh, two covers our senior high school. We are very fortunate in our country because the second highest official of the land happens to be our, uh, the vice president happens to be our secretary, Ma'am Sara Duterte. And she's all, she all, is also the incumbent uh, a chair of the CMEC, the, the Southeast Asian Ministers Council. So with her uh, positions, we all have the political will to further improve the educational system of our country and uh, had given us also the opportunity to visit other ASEAN countries and to learn from them. Uh, with the leadership of uh, VP Secretary uh, Sara Duterte, we had launched the Matatag Education Agenda. Uh, Matatag actually is a Filipino term which means resilient, but actually it's, a, it's an acronym, the MA, the MA, which stands for making the curriculum relevant and the producing job-ready uh, learners. The first uh, is, is, is speaks about the provision of uh, uh, services, basic uh, delivering basic services and the second ta is uh, to take appropriate actions to make uh, uh, education inclusive and the G uh, is to give support to our teachers. Um, and as much as I am part of the curriculum and teaching strand uh, for this dialogue I would like to underscore the recently launched Matatag uh, curriculum. So the Matatag curriculum, our Matatag curriculum, which covers uh, the kindergarten to grades one to 10, uh, in, include as salient features, the, the emphasis on the foundational skills, on literacy and numeracy, a clearer articulation of the 21st century skills were in the Information, media, and technology is uh, one of the important subjects uh, under our senior high school. And of course, with the Matatag curriculum, uh, which had been uh, opened to all the stakeholders of, of uh, education, when I say open, because we submitted this for public review. Before we launched the curriculum, we, we made the curriculum accessible to everyone. So we don't call it the DEPED curriculum, but this is the curriculum of uh, the Philippines, the DEPED curriculum. Just like the Indonesia, we have the Merdeka Merdek curriculum. Other countries call their curriculum the 21st century curriculum. Uh, in, in the country where you are in, we call it our Matatag uh, curriculum. And uh, I would like to to now relate uh, my, my uh, uh, presentation to the presentation of our, uh, sec our speaker, Mr. Felipe, when uh, he presented the framework. So when we say we aspire to have the best curriculum, which is at, at par with other countries, the curriculum is not the end of it all. And as presented in the framework, uh, Mr. Felipe mentioned that other components, uh, the, the curriculum must interplay with other components to really improve learning outcomes and to produce the learners that we want. So we, uh, a curriculum should uh, be supported by uh, our pedagogies uh, on assessment, on standards, uh, as well as training, the provision of training for our teachers, as well as the training of, uh, or the provision of uh, learning resources. And so with that, uh, I would like to mention that uh, among the initiatives of our country is the creation of the, uh, the national education portal, or we call it the Matatag portal, wherein uh, we, we call this as our national platform, wherein our teachers as well as our learners can be able to access 
uh, various learning resources because the platform contains subsystems which include our learning management system our uh, the learning resources portal as well as the assessment portal and of course we also would like to to underscore the importance of the provision of learning resources and uh, our VP secretary uh, would like that uh, uh, the learning resources were, will be made available wherever and whenever uh, whether in time of emergencies or in time of calamities so we have uh, uh, uploaded uh, learning resources and we had created a portal we call it learning resources kids portal uh, which contains um, uh, storybooks the self-learning modules that we had uh, created uh, during the pandemic and other gamified uh, learning resources uh, as regards to our initiative on uh, on uh, digitization Yes, I would like to commend uh, Mr. K uh, Dr. Kitipong Kiti for underscoring the importance of uh, digital transformation. Uh, with this, uh, as mentioned, we are now preparing our roadmap to integrate education technology uh, to teaching and uh, learning. And uh, as regards to the initiative on, uh, on uh, our greening programs, Earlier, earlier there was a discussion uh, when uh, when does uh, climate change should be properly taught to our to our learners uh, in the Philippine curriculum as early as kindergarten we had already incorporated or integrated uh, the themes uh, the, the climate change themes I remember the 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 song uh, or, or the bo book which says uh, everything you want to know you can learn it during your kindergarten class and so i can i can uh, recall the song rain rain go away no so we don't want heavy rains because we will be flooded and there are other learning areas where we integrate climate change just like uh, our in our science class when we study living things uh, we mention about uh, the conservation of the natural resources so, so we don't teach climate change as a separate subject, but uh, we integrated it in the different learning areas. Like, as I, as I have said, science, uh, uh, we, we have this uh, uh, learning area known as Araling Panlipunan or, we call it, or social studies, uh, the values education or good manners and right conduct. Uh, themes on climate change can be integrated in the, those learning areas. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Assistant Secretary. I mean, you. you have done a lot in terms of you, these initiatives on the learning portal and everything. And I hope that you will be able to share more with our participants during this forum. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary. Last but certainly not the least, Professor Taufan, please, okay. Professor so Taufan, just four minutes, <laughs> oh, so, four minutes so that yeah, okay. we can have the reception. Yeah. Thank you so much. You said one minute. Four minutes Not is 79 years, oh, okay. but four minutes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay thank you first uh, uh, to ADB for inviting me and also for supporting our program, perhaps the program together with the uh, Ministry of uh, Office of uh, Education of Indonesia. Uh, Prime Step is actually promoting research and innovation through modern and efficient uh, science and technology. Back, uh, I was expected to talk about energy transition and and green transition uh, for the uh, scaling up the innovation. Actually, our government of Indonesia has already has a clear target in terms of after signing Paris Agreement uh, to have a, a net zero emission in 2060. So. Uh, we have to uh, stick on, on on the target, and then actually uh, there is some challenges in that uh, energy transition uh, we, because uh, we have uh, to uh, support the uh, growth economy. So we need energy. Uh, currently, uh, only twelve point five percent contribution of 
uh, new and renewable energy uh, for the total national energy. So, and also uh, like we have uh, to have uh, like uh, energy security and energy independence. So that's kind of the challenges in terms of fulfilling the uh, the need of the energy of Indonesia. And also we have energy transition challenges because once uh, we change to another energy, we have to uh, ready with the new uh, energy system. So like for transportation, and then because like right now traditionally we have uh, we use uh, fossil fuel and then we transition in to electric we need to prepare also the uh, system of energy system of transportation also we have challenges in the decarbonization challenges uh, because we have to prepare our our human resources uh, to do that the technically because uh, uh, we, we know that indonesia is uh, technically uh, active so that's really very critical to make sure that uh, any uh, decarbonization through uh, carbon storage is, 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 is very safe. So uh, our strategy in terms of answering those challenges, actually that we have to select the uh, huge abundant uh, energy, renewable energy in Indonesia that uh, we already technically uh, ready, such as geothermal actually. So in terms of that, what we do is actually we develop we increase the capacity of of, of the of the people the, uh, the the human resources by uh creating a, a master a master degree in, in in geothermal so that's because uh, geothermal and we have uh resources potential resources of 11.5 giga gigawatt and uh produce only 2.5 we have a lot of to do then also thing is that uh, we have some like uh, another renewable energy, such like uh, 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 solar cell energy and also uh, battery. Uh, but right now, actually, uh, those kind of uh, new energy, actually, uh, there are big layers uh, right now. So we have, uh, when we do some research uh, and development, we have to select what kind of technology that we have to uh, focus on those two types of energy. So uh, for for solar energy, we have to focus on the emerging uh, emerging technology. So in that in that in that in in in, in that sense that we are starting uh, at the same at the same phase with the other players. So we don't we don't we don't start on the uh, the existing uh, the existing uh, 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 technology. And also, uh, our government already uh, uh, published a regulation, uh, regulation on the uh, carbon trading. Uh, carbon trading in terms of how to reduce the emission and also right now uh, uh, we have a, a carbon storage and uh, utilization center uh, we work with the government and industry to publish the policy in uh, for the uh, for the business process for the uh, carbon storage and also uh, mapping for the location of the carbon storage because the carbon storage actually is not just uh, because that's uh, um, uh, um, uh, many stakeholders involved in that, for example, is uh, Ministry of the uh, uh, Environmental and also Ministry of Earth Environmental and Ministry of Earth Mineral and Resources. So that's actually uh, 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 now because uh, one consider that carbon is, is a waste, uh, one consider as a storage uh, just to reduce. So how how that whole the stakeholder has the same uh, the same understanding and how do the business process on that. I think I think that's uh, maybe uh, we can you can follow up the question because the time is already finished. So okay, thank you, thank, thank you, you so much, Professor Taufan. Actually, Indonesia is you know very commendable because you're really into you know upgrade upskilling and reskilling your workforce. Uh, for renewable energy, so something to learn from also. Unfortunately, time is up. Um, maybe because I'm looking at the live question and answer, it's mostly for uh, Professor Kitty Pong. So is there any burning question from the room? Just one question because we're, you know, blocking our participants uh, reception this evening. So if, if is there any question? But otherwise, you can just approach our discussions and our presenters uh, for any clarifications you might have or you want to share with them. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us in this session. Um, thank you so much for our, to our discussions and presenters and uh, wish you uh, all the best in all your initiatives. I mean, I cannot, you know, uh, make a big conclusion because you have unique innovations 
very unique challenges and needs, but you have also done a lot of reforms and congratulations to all of you. And we would really like to wish you all well. Thank you so much. And please join our reception. It will be, I think, at 6 p.m. Thank you so much.